Hello everyone and welcome to Commodity Culture where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. My name is Jesse Day and before we dive into it, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investing advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is the founder and CEO of Monetary Metals, an investment firm that is unlocking the productivity of gold. Mr. Keith Weiner, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Good morning. Good morning. Now, I'd like to start with a question that I pose to all of my first-time guests, and that's on their origin story. So let me know how you first discovered investing and what ultimately drew you to the sound money camp and to the precious metal space. I guess I'd always been oriented toward investing. I guess like a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, we tend to think much farther into the future. It's not about get a dollar, spend a dollar ten. It's always about what can we build. Um, so I built and sold a software company called Diamondware, sold that to Nortel Networks, August 19, 2008. So it was right before the crash. It was the last acquisition Nortel ever did before they spun into bankruptcy, um, which was surreal to go through. And um, one of the last decent exits anybody had before the whole market shut down. So as the fall of 2008 was playing out, I'm sitting here with... 99% of my wealth and a couple of too-big-to-fail banks is cash, watching everything go down. And at first, I thought, well, this is great. Everything's on sale. You know, the idea is buy low, right? The lower you can buy, the better. But the more that went on, the more I became alarmed. Something seriously wrong. I started to read. I kind of felt like a moth drawn to flame. I just, like, was drawn into this. And, and you know, six, six, seven days a week, you know, eight, ten hours a day, just obsessively reading everything I could about markets and economics. I read every book by all the all the people you'd expect in the, in the gold space and other alternative things. Came to realize there's a monetary problem. Uh, came to the writings of this professor, Antal Fekete, this crazy old Hungarian professor who had some different ideas. And I said, okay, well, I don't know if he's right or not, but at least he's asking what I think are the right questions. Um, he offered a course that he was doing in Hungary and so I was like, okay, I have plenty of time, uh, you know, vacation time coming to me anyway. Uh, let me go out and, and do that. Eventually became his student, eventually started writing papers to you know, demonstrate concepts that I was learning. Eventually he said, well, you have enough here for a dissertation, which he kind of stickered me because I think that was a six-page paper and my dissertation was ultimately 126 pages, I think. Um, but uh, <clears throat> anyways, um, ended up getting a... Uh, not accredited, I could never get a job with this as a credential, but ended up getting a, uh, a PhD in essentially monetary economics or monetary science, as he called it. And um, decided after that, I'm not an academic. Before that, I was a college dropout in computer science anyway. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. What do I do with this? And I said, okay, how do you help the world rediscover gold and go to the gold standard? And the key is interest. you got to pay interest on gold. If you don't pay interest on gold, gold will just stay and people's hoards, they'll buy it and sell it occasionally, but uh, it'll never begin circulating as money. It's interest is the key, and, and, and finance is the key to interest. It can't be some self-referential, you know, in, inwardly facing Ponzi scheme as now we're seeing is blowing up in crypto, <clears throat> where everybody's making money off of everyone else in the same little, you know, circle. Uh, you have to be financing real productive things, and uh, that's what Monetary Metals was founded to do for a purpose, which is to help gold begin the long process of uh, you know, coming back into circulation after uh, government killed it by degrees since 1913, 1933, 1971. So that's my origin story in a nutshell. Fascinating. What, what was that professor's name again? Fekete, F-E-K-E-T-E. Okay, I, I want to look into his work. I'm fascinated. I'm intrigued. Now, I'm in Croatia, not too far from Hungary, and uh, I'm actually planning on visiting, so, so it'd be interesting to learn about that particular professor and, uh, and his work. Um, so I wanted to start off with uh, getting your thoughts on what you see as the main tailwinds for the precious metals as we are here in 2023. And let's start with gold. What, what are you seeing in the gold space that has you bullish at the moment? So... You know, uh, we, we put out every year uh, something called the Gold Outlook Report. <clears throat> and um, so it's, it's coming up. We'll have to usually do that at the end of January. So the one for 2022, I said, this is the toughest one by far. And we revisited 10 years of, of these reports and uh, gave ourselves 
you know, a report card on how, how our calls have been in the past. Um, I said this year by far is the hardest because we're sitting you know, at the beginning of the year, the Fed was threatening, but as of end of January had not yet begun the hike rates. So, okay, well, if they're really hell bent on hiking rates, that's going to take us down one fork in the road. And if this is just noise, this is more jawboning, which I've done many times in the past, then we go down a different road. And um, I said, if they really begin hiking rates, that is definitely not bullish for silver um, and, uh, you know, isn't necessarily bullish for gold either, although I think the gold price is going to perk up, as, as I think what we said in uh, end of January this year. Um, but the, the main, the main, you know, tailwind is the madness of, of central banks and the profligacy of, you know, the, the Treasury Department and the spending. And this is the same everywhere in the world. All the central banks have gone mad together in unison. Um, and all the, all the uh, treasuries of the world, uh, I guess in the, in, the, in the UK and other places, they call it the chancellor. But um, whatever they call it, the spending has gone mad. <laughs> the central bank policy has gone mad. And um, on top of that, it, it should be pretty obvious. I, I don't know why it isn't. They can't continue hiking. Um, you know, what, what they've done is they've managed to invert the yield curve. It's not just the two-year to 10-year. It's not just the three months to 10-year. It's the Fed funds rate to the 10-year is inverted, and pretty drastically. So um, they can't continue. They're, they're just in, causing an inversion. You could use the analogy of pushing on the string, but there's a lot more damage than that analogy might uh, suppose. The banks are in the, in the business of borrowing short to lend long. So if you invert the yield curve, you're basically forcing the banks into a money-losing situation. The Fed itself is losing now because their portfolio is not paying as much interest to them as their cost of funding is costing them. So the Fed used to be remitting money to the U.S. Treasury. Now they're in a place where they're running at a loss. Um, they can obviously, uh, quote-unquote, print money to make up for their loss. But I think even the people at the Fed, and having heard talks you know, given by many Fed officials over the years, I think they're very nervous, you know, to uh, to go there. It reminds me of Saruman saying to Gandalf in, in Lord of the Rings, and if the uh, and if you're losing money, where then will you go? Um, so I, th I think they're going to have to reverse, and when they do, I imagine that's going to be like the dam breaking, the uh, the headwinds such as they are, you know, start to evaporate, and the the tailwinds pick up even more, and you know, you want to own money. You don't want to be a creditor when the debtors are all mad, and that's the world that we're in. Yeah, great breakdown. I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on silver specifically as well, because I'm imagining you see this tailwind working in the favor of silver as well. And there's some who see silver as simply a levered play on gold, that silver is always going to go up more than gold in a bull market percentage-wise. And then there are those who say, well, hold on a minute, there's also the industrial side of things. And they're pointing to the demand from the solar industry specifically as a major catalyst that's going to ignite the silver price. How do you see silver? Um, are, are you in both those camps in one or the other? Um, how, how do you view it? Well, if you, if you take a look at the gold-silver ratio on a long period of time, just a little bit of mean reversion means that the price of silver is going to go up more than the price of gold. Um, and so, you know, if you're looking at owning, and, and, and we consider gold and silver to be the monetary metals, there are two of them, gold and silver. If you want to own money, um, and you think that there's likely to be a mean reversion in the bull market, then silver would be the place to be. And then you'll pick up some significant percentage relative to gold. Uh, we used to run a hedge fund to trade the gold-silver ratio. <clears throat> Decided to wind that down because we're really focused on fixed income. You're not uh, not trading per se, but um, you know I, I could see I could see the case for silver. Now, as far as the industrial demand, you know, side of it, that's essentially an argument for silver demonetization, that all the silver stocks accumulated over thousands of years will be drawn out and consumed and put into landfills in the form of broken solar panels and washing machines that have silver contacts them and, and and such. I'm not sure I agree with that, but uh, if I did. And then I, I'd have to I'd have to really think of silver money anymore, or is it demonetized and it's just become another platinum, palladium, rhodium, iridium? These are expensive 
uh, industrial metals, but they're not money. They become very volatile. The stocks that flows, so stocks is how much inventory exists in human hands. <clears throat> flows is how much is produced and consumed in any given year. Stocks to flows and all those other metals are tiny, very little stocks. And so, you know, the mere threat of a strike in the South African platinum mines and the platinum price can go up, you know, 30% or something like that. It's not the case in, in a monetary metal, which have these fast stocks to flows. So if that's the case, then it becomes a tradable, volatile, you know, less expensive platinum. It becomes more like what palladium used to be years ago when palladium was cheap. You know, 100 bucks an ounce and volatile and it's this and it's that. Um, I, I don't think that's going to be the case, but, um, you know, uh, there, there is an argument for a very long, long-term silver demonetization you know, process that goes back to uh, early to mid 19th century. So, so maybe. Well, let's talk manipulation in the precious metals markets now. Um, I had Craig Hemke on the show not too long ago, and uh, he he believes the market has been heavily manipulated, but he thinks some of the major players manipulating the market are starting to step away. Maybe. He's got a hunch. He's not saying that 100%. (laughs) But um, firstly, to what extent do you think the precious metals market is manipulated, and do you see it winding down, or do you think the the players who are smashing down the price are still out in full force? I I have to chuckle, and and you may or may not know, I've probably written more to debunk the idea of manipulation than anybody out there. And um, I wrote a a piece, which I think is probably the definitive piece. Uh, It's called Thoughtful Disagreement with Ted Butler. So um, Ted put out this article. You know, he used to write an awful lot about silver manipulation. And he said, look, I'm getting on in years now, I'm kind of retiring. I'm like, you know, this professor emeritus, I've done my thing, I've made my contribution, and, um, you know, here's my thesis, and um, I encourage thoughtful disagreement, but this is, you know, what I say. So I said, okay, in that spirit, Mr. Butler, let me write what I hope is a thoughtful response, and let me start by the opposite of a straw man, you know, a steel man, which is let me try to summarize your arguments for three main points um, in terms that you would have to agree with. And then <clears throat> if I get that right now, let me begin my criticism from there. And what I basically said is in any competition between scientific theories, suppose Einstein says that when you find a super duping pulsing magneto quasar thingy, light is going to bend to the left. And suppose Lorentz, or I'm sorry, Einstein has a theory, Lorentz has a theory, they're competing theories. Uh, scientists have to find a, an edge case where the theories predict the opposite behaviors. So suppose Einstein's theory leads to the belief that uh, light is going to bend to the left when you find one of these crazy objects out there, and Lorentz, his theory would lead you to think that light is going to bend to the right. So scientists sit on the edge of their seats waiting for somebody to build a telescope big enough right, to find one of these things in deep space, and then as soon as, as, soon as they, they launch the next telescope into space, everyone's like biting their fingernails. What is it going to be? What is it going to be? And then the images come in and the computers process it, and it's to the left. Lorentz is, you know, uh, is, is gone, and Einstein is vindicated, and, uh, you know, they can all, you know, take a deep breath again. So we have two theories. Mine is an arbitrage theory. Mine is that the banks are not naked short, but that's a, it's an arbitrage. People say, why would the banks buy all this gold just to hedge it? That's not the point. The point is to make a spread. If you can buy spot gold in 1800 and sell you know, February gold at 1807, you know, you're making seven bucks. That's why. And um, that's what the market makers do. They make very small amounts of money and very large volumes, but with very low risk because you bought the spot gold, you sold it forward, um, you're pocketing seven bucks, and you're offering a service to people who buy gold in the futures market. Um, That's what makes the futures sound, and that's why the futures track the price of spot so closely. If you were to plot futures over spot, um, you know, and, and, and see on a price chart, it would be two lines on top of each other. You'd never see the difference between the two. What keeps them tracking so closely? Right now, it was making a lot of news that some of the gold and silver ETFs, uh, or not, excuse me, not ETFs, the closed-end funds, like PHYS, are, are deviating and, and falling below the value of the metal per share and falling pretty significantly below because there's no arbitrage. If you see that that share is trading at a discount, you can't short metal and go long the shares 
because you can get killed in that trade. It's not there's no arbitrage available. But in futures and spot there is, that's what the banks do. And of course the classic um conspiracy theory that's been going around gold you know, gold community since at least a decade or two before I got into it in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, holds that the banks are shorting it for the purpose of manipulating it down. Half the time they say that the banks are illegally making a profit at the backs, of, you know, coming out of the backs of the investors. The other half of the time, it's a not-for-profit endeavor in order to somehow preserve the monetary system that the, the Fed is worried if the price of gold were to go up too much, people would lose confidence in the dollar, whatever that means. And uh, so they do this. I said, okay, let's find the corner case where uh, the theories predict opposite behavior. That corner case is when each futures contract goes into expiry as it approaches first notice day, what's the behavior? And if the banks are naked short, they would have to buy with urgency to close their short position with each expiring contract. If the banks are not naked short, if the nakeds are actually the longs or speculating without the, without the cash to take delivery, it's the longs who would have to sell with urgency. And uh, so you have two theories that predict opposite things. Let's take a look at the data. One of the things Monetary Metals has done, and we publish 60 60 odd different graphs every day for free on our website, looking at kind of the micro internals of the gold and silver markets. Let's take a look at all the data for all the futures contracts going back to 1996, which is the origin of our data set, um, uh, up to whenever that article was written on 2015 or 16 or something like that. And, you know, here's the data, and it shows very definitively that all these contracts move in the direction that our theory would predict not in the direction that the manipulation would predict. And so I said, in the spirit of Ted Butler, if anybody has a thoughtful disagreement, um, you know, please uh, please uh, speak up. This article went everywhere. It was on Zero Hedge. It was on La Metropole. It was on GATA. It was everywhere that everybody in the gold community would read. Um, I'm sure Butler woke up that morning with 100 emails. Do you see what this guy Wiener said? Do you see what this guy Wiener said? GATA had article, um, a couple of headlines in which I was reduced to a single word you know, Wiener says this, and what Wiener doesn't want to know, and I'm like, that's ironic. I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars building the software platform, years studying it. I licensed a data set at great expense from then Thomson Reuters, now Refinitiv, to get this data, what I don't want to know. Anyways, uh, all, all that was all controversial back and forth. Bartley never responded, and no one else ever responded with anything uh, substantive. Um, Hemke himself dropped some F-bombs, um, on, on Twitter, and, and that was it. And um, there was no thoughtful response to that. And so I, I think they, you know, if, if this is a scientific dispute, you know, this is the definitive scientific paper that stands that says um, it's, it's not manipulated, certainly not in that sense. Now, more broadly overall, there's, there's a manipulation that begins from the time that people go to nursery school, and that is do a Google images search for money. You will not see a single picture of gold or silver. You will not see precious metals coins. You will see pieces of paper with green ink on them um, and people holding fistfuls of it and stacks of it and printing presses with the sheets rolling off and, you know, two yards wide or whatever. Um, and so, you know, if you go to a conventional financial advisor and say, well, I want a portfolio full of gold and silver, they'll say, well, that's not a reasonable and prudent thing to do which means he could lose his license and get sued by FINRA or the SEC for, for being not reasonable, not prudent. You know, gold and silver are perceived as risky. Uh, so in that sense, uh, you know, it's almost mind control. It's almost the, the quote that I love from uh, Goethe, who says, there's none so hopelessly enslaved of those who falsely believe that they are free, that, uh, you know, we treat paper as money, gold as a risky commodity, silver as a doubly risky commodity, and um, even the gold community speaks of gold going up or down in, in reference to a, presumably a fixed reference point, which is the dollar. And they know the dollar is going down, but they can't help it and say gold went up today you know, relative to what? So it's like the, the dollar is a, is a log falling off the edge of a cliff. The other currencies may be more like bricks. If you know anything about physics, you know that the brick has a greater mass to surface area ratio. It will fall faster. Uh, as they all hit terminal velocity, and they're all looking at the top of the cliff saying the top of the cliff is going up. Well, not exactly. Um, 
So yeah, there's a manipulation in the sense that people have been programmed not to think of it as money, but not a manipulation in the sense that there's a nefarious actor that comes into the market to um, deprive you of your rightfully earned profits. Um, I, I don't think it works that way. That's very interesting. So you do think this psychological manipulation is intentional, that there are people who don't want the masses or the public to perceive gold and silver as money, or is it just a, a result of the fiat money system that we've been living with? I, I think it's more the latter. I mean, if you look at the Communist Manifesto, and I, I'm a big, I mean, obviously I'm not a communist, I'm the opposite, but I'm a big believer that everybody should understand the ideas of the opposing side on their own stated terms. And, um, you know, so, so Marx puts out these 10 planks, everybody should know what those planks are, and, and look in dismay as the U.S. implements one by one, all of them, or most of them, anyway, there's a few that aren't really germane in the 21st century, but, um, you know, confiscating the property of rebels, and, I don't know. Um, but arguably the most important plank uh, out of those 10 is um, number 10, which is uh, public schools. And so Marx understood very early on, you have to program the minds of the children. The state has to get control of their minds while they're still malleable before the kids know anything and then fill those, those kids' minds not only with bad content, but program them to a bad methodology. And once they have a bad methodology, then they're hopelessly, you know, hopelessly enslaved. Although Marx wouldn't put it in those terms. That was quite explicitly the intention. Um, the other, the other most important plank is number five, a central bank um, with a monopoly on uh, money and credit, and um, so we have both of those. The state is, you know, shoring up and reinforcing its control over people. Uh, Marx never could have thought of healthcare uh, at that time; that wasn't really a thing. With healthcare, wasn't really much of a thing in 1848. Um, but if he had thought of it, if he'd written in more recent decades. There would have been a plank about control of the health care with the state monopoly over socialized medicine. So you control people's health, you control their money, you control the minds of their children. And, you know, people can't escape from, you know, the socialist uh, uh, trap. So in that sense, yes, they're manipulating everybody to think of their their uh, irredeemable credit paper as if it were money. Um, but not not because they're thinking of gold and silver as such. You talk to anybody in the government today, I mean, they're not smarter or more educated than anyone else. These people get elected from the mainstream. If you're outside the mainstream, on either side, you know, you're not really electable. They don't really think about it. I, I, I like to use the analogy, you go to some central banker today and ask him about gold. It would be like going to an engineer Tesla and asking about carburetors. I mean, at first he'd pause and he'd kind of squint at me and he'd be like, wait, what? Haven't those been obsolete for like 50 years? No, we don't deal with those things here at Tesla, you know. There's, we don't have gasoline, let alone carburetors. And if we did have gasoline, it would probably be fuel injection or something. So go away, you know, this, you're wasting my time with this rubbish. That's, I think, you know, that's how they would look at, you know, gold. Well, but moving into uh, central bank digital currencies, because I think that kind of ties in part and parcel with, with what you were just talking about. You know, you gave an amazing interview on Liberty and Finance recently where you discussed the topic at length. And I'd like to pose the question here. Um, you know, the Fed has announced that they are going to be testing a, a digital currency. Um, we're seeing, you know, the ECB has said the same thing. The Bank of Canada said the same thing. In Nigeria, they now have a, a sort of CBDC that they're trying to force on people by limiting the amount of cash withdrawals they can make from ATMs. Um, do you think... A CBDC is on its way in America. Will the people ultimately accept it? And what are the implications for individual freedom if these digital currencies are fully adopted? Well, I'll take the second to last question first because it's the easiest answer. I, I have to admit, I got no idea what the people are going to accept. After, after watching them accept masks and shutting down businesses for, depending on where you live, either months or years, um, I just have to say, I scratch my head and say, I, I have no idea what people yeah, are capable yeah. of accepting anymore. I, I, I feel like an alien in my own land on, on that front. Yeah, um, I, I feel you, brother. That's why I'm in Croatia and not in Canada yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah, Canada was one of the worst ones, but not quite as bad as Australia and right. not quite as bad as New Zealand. And then the Chinese are in a whole different league. Yeah. You know, locking down individual apartment blocks and things like that. Um, I think that... 
Of course, the powers that be love the additional controls that they get for forcing everybody to use some sort of CBDC. I, I do think they have that control anyway over the banking system. I think it's really important to say the banks, I mean, every business today is regulated to some degree, and that means that you're not free to do as, as you want, and it is illegal to act without permission, and you can't just go build a house without a building permit, for example. The contractor has to be licensed. Certain trades, obviously engineers, architects, have to have a license in order to even draw up the, the plans for this building. Um, but banks uh, are, are not just regulated, but supervised. And so the big banks actually have to pay at their own expense to house government employees in their buildings. Um, and those people have broad latitude to dig into their internal records, invite themselves to internal meetings, walk in, what's, what's going on, who's doing what? No, I want you to do this, not that. Lend to this person, don't deny this person a loan, approve this loan. They're supervised. And, um, you know, today, certainly all major transactions are done through the banking system. Um, you know, cash is, you know, cash has all the problems of the 19th century. It's unwieldy, it's a physical thing, all that stuff. So, um, they're already in control and they can already shut down, you know, as the Canadian uh, so called freedom truckers proved. And I wasn't necessarily a fan of blocking all the innocent people in their driveways who couldn't go to the doctor, or buy groceries, or go to work or whatever. But um, people who wanted to donate to those truckers who obviously were foregoing their livelihood while they were, were there in Ottawa, um, you know, found that not only were their payments denied, I guess in some cases their bank account, they're frozen out of their own bank accounts for a while. The government already has that power. I don't think they need to go to CBDCs to take that power. Maybe it would be easier for them, but I'm not sure how big an issue that is. However, what I think um, the main driver of this is going to be is negative interest rates. I think they realize negative interest rates are coming. And you know, getting back to my comment, to the even they believe that they can keep hiking rates. I don't think so. Um, and many countries, it started in Switzerland, but it spread to Germany, Scandinavia, uh, the Netherlands, the UK, Japan, um, had negative interest rates on at least part of their yield curve. Switzerland had it all the way out to the 50-year maturity. And um, with negative interest rates, there's an incentive to make a run on the bank. Uh, so going back to 1933, the real purpose of Roosevelt's executive order that's infamous in the gold community, prohibiting the ownership of gold, wasn't really to grab the loot, though I'm sure that pleased him to no end. The purpose was to get control of monetary policy and stop the run on the banks. So once people have irredeemable paper, well, what's the point? You're a creditor anyway. Whether you own the paper, whether you own the bank deposit, they're, they're largely equivalent. And so he ended the runs on the banks. So there's no such thing as a run on the bank and paper until you get to negative interest rates. Paper has a zero yield, which is not particularly attractive. But if the bank account has minus 1%, minus 2%, where's that limit? The people say, well, this sucks. I'm going to pull my paper out to zero. And that's when the government is going to come along with the CBDC and say, oh, that paper is no longer legal. Um, and the only thing that's money now is uh, central bank digital currency. Um, you're not going to be able to buy a latte or buy food or, or fuel or anything else with paper anymore after a certain date. And they'll force people into it. And then, of course, the CBDC is be programmable to have a matching negative interest rate, uh, you know, to whatever the bank deposit rate is. So that, I think, is, is going to drive it. And I think they're going to feel they have no choice. Each bad decision they've made, and, and these bad decisions stretch back well over a century, as I trace it, um, ultimately even to the Coinage Act of uh, 1792. Um, and, um, you know, each bad decision they make leads to bad consequences. Do they ever reverse the original bad decision? No, of course not. Um, people don't even understand the origins anymore. They just lead to the next bad decision, and the next one, and the next one will be central bank digital currencies. We're not there yet. We got a little bit of time to breathe before that, um, you know, straitjacket is applied. Right. So, do you think it is inherently risky to keep too much money in the banking system at this point in time? Because we see what happens in places like Lebanon, obviously. Some people are aware of the history of, of bank runs and bail-ins that have happened at various points. But, 
you know, it's that it's that thing where people always believe it's not going to happen here. Oh, that happened over here at, at that time in some poor country where there was a dictator running it. I live in a country that follows the rule of a law. I mean, there's Canadians who believe this at, at, at this point in time, which is insane. But is money in the bank at risk to, to any extent in these, you know, legacy brand Western countries at this point in time? You know, I was going to say, uh, to, to your point, the people in Argentina, certainly before World War II, believed they were in a great country. And Argentina was the wealthiest country in Latin America. Um, and then, uh, you know, moving to first national socialism and then international socialism, uh, you know, drain that all and they become just another third world, you know, terrible place. Um, and th this is where now when you say, you know, is your money safe in the banks or safe holding paper currency more generally, you have to differentiate, you know, the U.S. and the U.S. dollar from the rest of the world. Enough of the U.S. dollar isn't on the same trajectory. That's not the point at all. This is one of those cases where Americans are going to be right for the wrong reasons. Say, yeah, we're America. We're better. No. The monetary system is wired in a certain way, uh, going back particularly to Bretton Woods, the insane treaty that, of course, the rest of the world was in smoldering ruins. The U.S. had first begun to ramp up its military, dictated to the rest of the world, this is how it's going to be, guys. And, and you're going to like it. And the rest of the world said, yes, sir. Well, thank you, sir. May we please have another, sir. There were no position to dispute anything with the United States, you know, at the end of World War II. What people don't realize, and they thought, okay, this is this treaty is terrible for the rest of the world, which is true. And by zero-sum logic, if something is bad for one party, it must be good for the other. Because if you're losing, the other party must be winning. That is sort of intuitively common sense. Of course, that's wrong. Read Stephen Covey to see why. Win lose is not actually uh, you know winning. There is such a thing as win win. That insane treaty was architect architected by a Mr. Harry Dexter White, who was later proven to be a tool working for the Soviet Union, and I think this was his attempt to come up with something that appeared to be in the interest of the U.S. but was actually designed to undermine the U.S. Um, you know, later later economists, fifteen years later, you have Triffin writing about the Triffin dilemma. You know, the U.S. is the issuer of the world's, you know, currency and domestic policy might demand sounder money with less issuance, but the rest of the world is desperate for credit to fuel their, you know, rebuilding and their growth. So you have this conflict. Uh, you had Jacques Rueff. You had, obviously, the famous episode of Charles de Gaulle saying, we're going to send a battleship into New York Harbor, uh, offload pallets of $20 bills and onload much smaller pallets of uh, gold bricks to bring back to France. Um, and, you know, so that led to the end of, uh, you know, gold redeemability for the dollar. But anyways, the, the world is wired in such a way that the dollar is the center of the credit universe. All the other currencies are dollar derivatives. And as credit is contracting, which is what you get in a bust cycle, um, it retracts from the periphery to the core. The dollar is the core. So if you're in Croatia, I, mean, I don't know anything about the banking system specific to there, but all the peripheral currencies are not going to be a good place to be, even if the banking systems are safe. And secondly, the banking systems, in many cases, are not. Uh, not I hate to say not as safe as the U.S., because that implies the U.S. is safe. They are less, they're even more unsafe. I like to put it that way. It's not that the U.S. banking system is necessarily good, but it's not as bad as elsewhere in the world. And so this is why the dollars in this, people call it rising, and I have to uh, chuckle at the irony of that. They'll measure the dollar in anything except gold. The idea, if you say the dollar is 17 milligrams of gold, that is offensive to everybody left and right and center. So they'll measure the dollar in terms of consumer prices, uh, you know, purchasing power, which of course are measured in dollars, so they have a nice little self-referential thing. Or they'll measure the dollar in terms of its derivative currencies like euro and pound and yen, which is kind of silly. So let's say the dollar is going up. Against what? So you have, you know, different pieces of wood and stone and brick that are in free fall. And, you know, from the if you put a, a GoPro camera on one of the bricks and then you see the dollar, which is a log, which is falling slightly less rapidly, you see the dollar's going up. They're all going down, right, at, at different rates and, and the others are going down faster. Um, and then can you have bail-ins? I think Europe is farther along in implementing the laws, you know, allowing bail-ins. Um, so, uh, no, I don't think that's safe. And I think, unfortunately for the rest of the world, it is the way it is. 
Um, and the dollar is the currency to be in if you're going to be in a, in a paper currency. It's dollars. Uh, the rest of the world, not so much. And the banking systems of the rest of the world, you know, not so much. Where's going to be the next Cyprus? Where's going to be the next banking system where they declare a bank holiday and you can't make withdrawals? You know, it's anybody's guess. There's so many teapots about to boil right now that, you know, who knows where that is. And I'm not uh, necessarily studying the specific instances, but, you know, bad things are coming for sure. So will we ever be able to return to a gold standard or some other form of sound money? Is that dream long gone? Obviously, it's a fantasy of every gold bug out there. You have some people in the camp of it's coming any time now, everything's going to collapse, and then people are going to realize the value of sound money, and we're going to have some kind of gold back currency or some kind of gold back token on the blockchain as our, our means of transaction. There's the BRICS nations currency people are talking about. Supposedly, they're going to back it with either a basket of commodities or with gold. Um, or are we looking at just a more long protracted move towards central bank digital currencies, more control? Control, and then maybe decades down the road, we, we could see a return to sound money. How, how do you see this all playing out? Well, one way or the other, we're going to end up back on gold. So first of all, let me address the other commodities. So think about the amount of value to, to buy kind of a nice near luxury, you know, Audi, you know, maybe a loaded Honda Accord, you know, kind of an affinity kind of car. You, you know, the amount of, of the, the physical size of that, if that were gold, it would be, I'm trying to think what I have on my desk here. I have a battery pack for, for going on travel. It would be a lot smaller than this. It would be enough gold to buy that car. You could stick this in your pocket. And, I mean, gold probably would probably weigh this amount. Gold is much denser. It would be smaller than this. You could put it in your pocket and walk down the street with, it, with that amount of value. If that were crude oil, which is one of the things, one of the commodities that people love to say is money, I mean, you're talking about a swimming pool full of stuff. So, you know, the idea of redeeming your currency for, for crude oil is absurd. And not to mention, not only is it bulky, it's toxic, it's smelly, it's flammable. Um, you know, it, it, it oxidizes when it's exposed to oxygen or sunlight. It requires specialized, you know, storage equipment. It's regulated. I mean, you can't just put that in your swimming pool in your backyard. Um, you, you know, the other commodities are all impractical, either perishable or far too bulky. Um, they don't really work. So if you're talking commodity standard, you know, the world over a period of thousands of years in the ancient world converged on gold and at, at the rejection of salt and cattle and cowrie shells and all kinds of other things. It all evolved to gold because of gold's unique physical characteristics um, and, uh, and its economic circumstances. Uh, I do think that one way or the other, we end up back on gold. So we're on a trajectory right now where you know, people say, okay, you know, consumer prices are rising. You know, due to inflation, whatever one thinks of that, certainly the central banks have gone mad. But it's really a process of capital consumption. They've incentivized the consumption of capital. That's what the wealth effect is. And it's ever more debt to get ever less GDPs, so ever more, you know, squeeze for ever less juice for that squeeze. And as the capital is consumed, things continue to grind and get worse and worse and worse. Um... That's where you see, you know, this rising disparity between the wages of the workers and the, at least the net worth on paper of the, uh, the top 1% class, those who, you know, you, you know, own assets and usually on credit, on, on, on margin, um, and the pay of people whose comp is tied to asset prices, like bankers and CEOs, right? As asset prices going up, they're getting seemingly richer and richer and richer. It's all a process of consuming capital. Well, capital is what makes modern civilization possible. We don't work any harder today than they did in the ancient world. Arguably, we work less hard. And yet, look at all the stuff we enjoy they couldn't have even imagined 10,000 years ago. The difference is capital. And we are consuming, we're eroding, we're standing up atop this enormous structure of capital while we're, we're taking an axe. It's like watching one of those old, not old, I guess they still have them, you know, the chainsaw, steel chainsaw games where the guy stands on a log and has to chop out the log in between his own feet. You know, very dangerous thing, and then he better leap off at the right moment, otherwise he's going to collapse with it. We're we're chopping out the capital base on which we stand. And if that if that trend continues all the way to the end, civilization collapses, which has happened from time to time. There are ancient civilizations that have failed, and obviously the most famous example is Rome, 476 A.D. The population of the city of Rome was over a million people, pre-collapse. Post-collapse, it was six thousand or eight thousand. 
So, you know, was that 92 to 94% loss of population? A few of them probably fled somewhere. Most of them would have died either in the sacking of the city or in the long starvation and exposure and all the things on the road or in conflicts and fights. You know, people, you know, nobody really likes uh, refugees fleeing on the road. All the towns would have put up barricades that would have been little pitched battles. And, you know, anyways, it depopulated Europe. Um, and then it took, you know, arguably uh, 1,400 years or so for the world to get back to the level of luxury and engineering and technology that the Romans had achieved by that point in time. Um, and so if, if we don't do it the other way, that's we're going to end up back on gold because there'll be no such thing as government paper in a post-collapse in a sort of apocalyptic world. Or what I founded Monetary Metals to do is to do it the other way, which is begin gold and, and silver to, to begin circulating by paying interest. Um, in a certain sense, I, I would offer a working, a good, I think a good working definition of a gold standard is when anybody who wants to can deposit their gold and earn interest on their gold in gold. And that's, that's a working gold standard, and which means that when we scale up, we, we, uh, we bring that about, that, that property becomes true. And um, so we're working towards that as, as a purpose. Yes, we make money. Every business is, is in business to make money. But we do it by making money for our clients. And uh, mon literally money, gold in this case. Um, and if we can do that, then we avert this disaster. Otherwise, I, I think it's a pretty bleak future. And um, so I looked at where would you go hide up? And, you know, if there's going to be a, a coming zombie apocalypse, where would you go? And I looked at all kinds of places and I realized, you know what? They have to be rural. You have to have a big block of agricultural land. It's, it's not a I mean, I'm a city kind of guy, so it's not a particularly fun place to be. Even while civilization holds together, you're going to spend all of your resources to, to build the perfect bunker and put in years worth of dried food and all that. But then post-apocalypse, once you've eaten all that food, you're emerging into a world that, at best, let's assume that there's no warlords feuding over your particular piece of ground. At best, you're in an 18th century agricultural subsistence world where it's, you know, 14 hours a day, 16 days a week of backbreaking labor to earn a subsistence you know, scratching it out of the ground, um, which, by the way, is a young man's game. Life expectancy was 35 years old. So I'm, I'm past my shelf life already, and that's not happening tomorrow. That's who knows how many years away that is. So I said, I'm not going to try to prepare for that world. If that happens, I'm going to get swept up and probably killed along with everybody else. I'm going to try to work to avert that uh, scenario and, um, you know, try to try to bring gold back into... So I, so I guess I'll, I'll end this whole rant on a, on the thought that I love from Winston Churchill. He was talking about, I guess, war ultimately. But he said, God bless the Americans. After trying everything else, they'll do the right thing. And I think the sentiment there kind of applies. Like after we try everything else, uh, you know, a central bank, ma central bank managed gold standard like the U.S. had after 1913. Then, you know, the, the European powers had a gold bullion standard. You know, they eliminated the gold coins, but the 400-ounce bars were still redeemable for those few people. 400 ounces of gold then, as now, was, you know, a small fortune. Um, you know, that was redeemable. And then after that, a gold exchange standard after 1944, where all the other currencies were only redeemable for dollars at a fixed rate. And the dollar was redeemable for gold, but only to foreign banks and, you know, foreign central banks and foreign governments. And then finally, irredeemable paper after 1971. Maybe even after that, central bank digital currency. After we try all these piles of rubbish, maybe um, you know we'll say, you know what, let's go back and uh, maybe gold wasn't as bad as the mythologies made it out to be, and maybe centrally planned, you know, credit money isn't as good as the uh, as the theories uh, predicted it would be. It's not behaving that way, and um, you know, I think like so many of the social trends, you look at we had drug prohibition. Our alcohol prohibition, we had slavery, we had Jim Crow, and people say, well, nobody's interest is to fix it. I say, I don't, I don't agree. When, when enough people perceive it to be unjust, right? It wasn't, it wasn't the alcohol companies that were successful in lobbying for repeal of prohibition. Um, you know, if you went to the, to the Deep South in 1950 and said, uh, is there ever going to be civil rights reform? They would have said, no way. 
you ask a black person or a white person, they would say it's not, not happening, not possible, the entrenched system is too deep. But when enough people become angry at, at injustice, then um, you know, change can happen. You know, to, to use the, uh, the words of somebody I, uh, I know and, and respect, things become highly nonlinear at that point. And then a few short years later, the whole Jim Crow regime was done. Um, obviously, alcohol prohibition ended. And now drug prohibition, I mean, marijuana is basically done being prohibited, I think. That, you know, it's all over, but the, but the shouting, they're mopping up now. But uh, everywhere, I think it would be it would be legal to buy and smoke marijuana. Taxed, regulated, whatever, but it was no longer going to be a crime to possess it. Um, and I think I think we'll get there. Because I think there is a monstrous injustice of inflicting, imposing uh, irredeemable paper currency on people, um, but people don't get it yet, and you know the mainstream doesn't get it yet. And when they do, watch out, there will be a nonlinear, highly nonlinear change. Very well said. And why don't we end on monetary metals? Because you touched on it a little bit there, but maybe you could break it down in more detail for us and let us know exactly how it works. So. Um, we, we're not a bank, we're not regulated as a bank, we cannot use the word bank, um, but we have a gold storage program, people can store gold with us, like a lot of other companies, but the difference is we will present various opportunities to lease your gold, so leasing, this is a very physical thing, it's not a financial product, um, bullion dealers, jewelers, refiners, there are a lot of industries where they're obliged to work with gold as either inventory or work in progress, and uh, so we lease them that gold. Which does two things. One, it provides the, the capital for that inventory. Gold is very expensive, obviously. Um, and also, number two, they're not taking the price risk. If you borrow a million dollars to buy a million dollars worth of inventory and the price of gold drops 10%, you now have a $900,000 asset, but you still owe a million dollars. You're insolvent. So we eliminate that price risk and the need for hedging. And um, the company who's getting that lease is, is happy to pay interest on it or lease fee, technically, um, and that's how we pay interest to uh, our clients. We also, for accredited investors, have other programs that are, you know, for accredited investors only uh, with lending. So we just announced a deal uh, to lend to it. It's a Norwegian public company called Akobo Minerals. Uh, they have a, uh, a mine asset in Ethiopia, so there's Africa risk. But um, on the leasing side, um, we pay two to three percent interest net to the investors um, on this particular one. So we did a gold loan to a Kobo. We parceled that out as a securities offering, which we call a gold bond. These are the first proper gold bonds since FDR in 1933. Um, and on uh, that particular gold bond, we're paying 19 percent interest gold on gold. So, yes, there's Africa risk. There's no getting around that. Um, but. Uh, you know, we did our due diligence. We feel that uh, the risk is understood and mitigated, and um, we disclosed it, obviously, to the investors. And so there's, there's a variety of opportunities. We see ourselves as creating the asset in between. So if you look at paper, there's a whole risk-return spectrum from no risk and no return, like owning paper cash in a bank vault, all the way up to, you know, leverage ETFs or whatever. And every gradation in between it's very fine granularity. And gold, it's a barbell for monetary metals. You can own the metal itself, or you can own futures or ETFs, which are basically metal with varying degrees of leverage, but it's still metal. No risk and no return on its own terms. Or you can own equities in mining companies. And equities is the most risky end of the capital structure. Mining companies are more risky, arguably, than consumer staples or infrastructure or a lot of other kinds of equities you could own. And that's it. And so we're creating things in the middle. A lease is pretty close to this end. It's the lowest risk thing that we can think of that still pays a return. The risk is not zero. There definitely, anybody who says there's a risk-free return, I've seen so many slide decks in crypto, and they literally say risk-free on them. I'm like, how did any investor, any sophistication accept that? I don't know. Um, and then the bond is somewhere of greater risk, but still lower risk than the equity. There are people who buy a Kobo shares, and we as the Creditors are in a lower risk position than that. Obviously, we don't have a 10-bagger upside either. It's fixed interest, and that's it. Um, so we're creating those assets in the middle, and fixed income, I think, is a universal human need is to earn interest on your savings. 
Um, and so we're doing this again. It's for purpose. Our investors make money. We are a for-profit business. We are doing this to make money. There's no altruism here. You will not hear me talk the way Sam Bankman Fried did about the purpose of making money is to give it all away and maximize everyone else's utility other than your own. No, no. This is absolutely self-interest, and we appeal to the self-interest of our customers. And ultimately, if we can scale this in a very big way, we can bring gold and silver back into circulation as money um, and thereby help the world fix a problem that we're, we're right now careening towards. So the website is monetary-metals.com. Um, follow me at, at Real Keith Wiener on Twitter. Um, and uh, we have a ton of articles that we write about macro. We have all these charts on, on gold and silver for free on the website. We have uh, analysis on the gold and silver markets and you know price what we think the price action is likely to be. There's a ton of content there, and um, that's what we do. Great. Well, I'll put links to both your Twitter and the Monetary Metals website in the description. It's been awesome having you on. I learned so much and really looking forward to hopefully having you on again in the future to continue the conversation. Thanks for having me, and I look forward to coming back. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.